Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Miranda Kossoff. She is an author, and she has released the book, The Rope of Life, a memoir, which talks about her father. It discusses her relationship with him, his suicide, and his successful life. And of course, she'll also talk a little bit about herself, but this episode, of course, will deal with some heavy topics, of course, um, and mental illness. And so there will be a lot of different things that we cover, but I'm excited for Miranda to be here today and talk a little bit about her book and her life. So thank you so much, Miranda. Why don't you go ahead and tell us tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, wow. What to say? I, um, I'm an author and writer. Um, I have also been an artist. I taught myself, well, with the, with the aid of a lot of classes and experts, taught myself metalsmithing. And I was doing that on the side when I was still working. And so um, I was a member of Frank Art Gallery in Chapel Hill, a member artist, and loved that, loved being around other creatives. Um, so that's part of my story. And uh, I like to use the two, the, the visual art and then the writing to enhance each other. So if I get stalled in the writing process, then I go into my studio and um, pound some metal or you know, come up with a design for a necklace or play around with my paints because I've done mixed media collage as well. So otherwise, um, I live between Chapel Hill and Pittsburgh. And um, I love travel. I have traveled all over the world uh, during my years as an adult. And one of the things that, that's mentioned in my book is that when I graduated from college, I wanted to put as much distance between myself and Danville, Virginia as possible. Because Danville, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s, when I came along, it was the Jim Crow South. And Danville is a small textile, and was textile and tobacco town, still small. And it was also a central um, piece of the civil rights movement. Most people don't know, even people who lived in Danville don't know that Martin Luther King visited Danville twice, no, three times in 1963. And the uh, daily paper, the Register and Bee, uh, the owner was a staunch segregationist. Um, her name was Stuart Grant, and she refused to cover the civil rights demonstrations in Danville. Um, but there was a very strong movement and it was a very important work um, the blacks in Danville were doing. So, you know, being from Danville and trying to escape Danville is part of my story and part of the reason that I've lived abroad. Uh, the first job that promised to get me out of the country was the job I was going to take when I was a senior in college. So it just so happened the Red Cross was recruiting at William and Mary, where I went to school, and they promised me a post overseas as long as I did one year in the States, then I could go abroad. Uh, so I did a year in Alexandria, Virginia, actually at Fort Belvoir Military Hospital as a hospital social worker. And I worked with young men um, torn up from battle in Vietnam, both psychologically and physically. Um, it was rewarding work. It was also eye-opening and and sad because I, you know, there was the draft then, and a lot of them hadn't signed up to go, didn't believe in the war, and found themselves in that situation, which must be terribly off, terribly tough on your psyche and your mind. So after a year at Fort Belvoir, um, was, 
Shortly after the year mark, I got a call from Red Cross headquarters saying we have a shortage in the Far East. And um, the woman who's hospital field director in Japan is leaving to get married. Um, can you take this post? And I just said, my bags are packed. So I put a lot of distance then between me and my hometown. What else to say about that? Well, Japan was fascinating. I have a couple of anecdotes. Uh, I was, I'm no longer five foot eight, but I, when I was young, I've shrunk. I used to be five foot eight. I had dark, dark brown hair and very um, pale blue eyes. So I stood out. And especially in the small town of Yokosuka, um, being a, what the Japanese call a gaijin, a foreigner, uh, I would go to a shop, say, and buy some hand milled soap or some other little toiletry item. And the second time I went, the shop girls would bow and then they would get the things that I ordered or asked for before without my having to ask because they remembered me. I stood out. Uh, and the other incident happened around the arrival of a U.S. nuclear sub. It was supposed to be kept a big secret, but um, there were guys with loose lips who made liaisons with the women of the night at, at, the, uh, at the dockyard. And so people got wind of this uh, approach of a U.S. nuclear submarine, and there were, for Yokosuka, massive demonstrations against it. And I happened to be coming back from town, walking back onto the base, and I was standing on a corner, and this whole, it was almost like a parade of protesters were filing by saying, Yankee, go home. And I'm standing there, and I'm the Yankee that they're telling to go home. A, you know, a few eyes turned to me, but the Japanese are extremely polite. I wasn't ever worried about my safety. There's generally one uh, Japanese police officer for three or four demonstrators, so there was no ch chance that it was going to get out of hand. Um, so I just waved, and then... After the last person passed by, I darted across the street. Uh, but my, my experiences in Japan were, were very positive. The Japanese were so accommodating, and they would help me if I got lost and wanted to, to find a certain address. And, and I didn't speak enough Japanese. I learned a little bit, some sort of pidgin Japanese. So since we couldn't really communicate directions that well, a couple of times people would actually walk with me several blocks to the place I was looking for and deposit me there. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed being around the Japanese people and, and being off base. Um, I had one week on, one week off in terms of being on 24-hour call. And so the week off I tried to, um, in the evenings, go out. I had a Japanese friend and try to go out and be like a Japanese person. So that was that experience. But as all good things do, it came to an end and I came back to the States. But I have lived in England also. And I've traveled all over Europe. I've been to Tahiti, to Turkey, uh, uh, many places in South America, Buenos Aires, twice for tango. I used to do our dance Argentine tango. So that's the, the birthplace of tango. And that was a lot of fun. What else about me? Um, traveling, gardening. I've always loved that. And I've always been a huge reader. I started reading books well, having books read to me as a child, but by the time I could read for myself, I read all the Nancy Drew mysteries. And your generation may not know these books at all, but Nancy Drew was hot stuff back then because she was solving cases. 
And um, it was a great, it was a whole series of books. And as I got older toward middle school, I started reading English, the English classics, um, like Oliver Twist, um, others of that time period. And I am blocking on the author's name. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot. I know him so well because I read all of his books when I was a preteen and teenager. Um, anyway, reading has always been like breathing for me. And I've usually got two or three books going at the same time. Are you talking about Charles Dickens? Yes, thank you. Isn't that an awful thing to forget? Charles Dickens. Yes. <laughs> I had read everything by Charles Dickens by the time I was 16. Yes, I'm I'm really bad at like connecting book titles with authors. So I was like, I will go to Google and see if this is <laughs> correct. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I will say that um, I did read Nancy Drew when I was younger, and there's, I believe, actually still not like probably the original series, but still like Nancy Drew things being written. Um, so she's still, you know, alive and well. Well, that's good to know because uh, she was my friend. We went on adventures together, and I, I would hate to see that she just lapsed into oblivion. Yeah, definitely. I loved hearing. Um, about about Japan and also just in general about your life. It's one of the things I love about this podcast is getting to hear what people like like to share about themselves. So can you talk a little bit um, with all of your travel, some of the different cultures that you've experienced? Yes, um, I think one of my mo most memorable trips was to Turkey and I went by myself. Um, I was in um, Istanbul for a week and stayed at a little boutique hotel. And the first night after I arrived, I was sitting on the um, roof of my hotel, which had a restaurant that served you at tables on the roof. And I looked out and I saw the moon shining on the Bosphorus and I could hear the Muezzin's call to prayer and see the Blue Mosque, the famous Blue Mosque, and Hagia Sophia. You could see their spires, and they were lit up at night. And I just thought to myself, wow, it doesn't get any better than this. This is, this is just a dream come true, and I'll never forget this. And then I went to a little town called Ibrahim Pasha in the Cappadocia region of Turkey. Cappadocia is very hilly and mountainous, and it has these strange rock formations um, that were over the years eroded to look like, like a frosty freeze cone of ice cream, except it was, uh, I think it was called tufa rock. But what was so interesting in Ibrahim Pasha was, well, I didn't speak any uh, Turkish. I, I learned a few words to be polite, but I discovered that the people in this little village were exceptionally um, generous and open-handed. They were poor. Um, and I think they lived together well because they always helped each other out. And it was interesting, you know, the men being Muslims, the men were separated from the women and there was a, a tea house in the middle of town where all the men would congregate and smoke. And at that time I had a very short haircut and um, I started greeting the women because I wanted to be friendly to the, to these people. And I would say, Merhaba, which is hi, hello. And they would turn away from me and not even look at me. And I thought, well, what's up with that? I'm being friendly here. I don't understand. <laughs> And it turns out, um, oh, I forgot to mention the fact that I was in Ibrahim Pasha to do a week-long art workshop. And I stayed in a cave. Um, two artists uh, from the Netherlands uh, relocated to Turkey, bought this place, and converted the caves that were in their, their little acreage into rooms. 
and it had all the modern amenities. The only problem was the the ceiling shed, and and they said uh, that's why there's a a net over the bed is to catch whenever the the ceiling would start falling in a little bit. You know, like small pieces of of dirt and stuff. And so everything got coated. It was lying like clothes or things lying around left in my room had this little sheen of um, tufa dust all over it. So anyway, the the Dutch artist that I was studying with spoke fluent Turkish as well as English, as well as her native language. And so I, I told her my dilemma about why I, I can't, uh, why I'm getting the cold shoulder from the women in the village. And she said that one of them asked her uh, why I didn't bring my wife. And then she realized they thought I was a man because I had very short hair. Um, they didn't notice that this man had breasts, you know, and this man was not wearing manly clothes, but, you know, and they're not supposed to speak to men who aren't their husbands. So once that got straightened out, I mean, and it was a small town, so once something's out, the whole town knows about it. And so the women then were very friendly. Um, and they raised a lot of their own food. You wouldn't think that things like tomatoes would grow so well in this powdery soil that your feet sink down into. But I went tomato picking with uh, one of the the men I met who run who runs a little antique and artifact shop, and he asked me if I wanted to go with him and his wife or his daughter, I can't remember which, to pick tomatoes. And they were huge. And they were the, be they were the best tomatoes I've ever had. So once people knew that I liked tomatoes, they would bring me tomatoes. If I was walking down the street, a woman would hail me from her courtyard and, and pulls down some grapes from a grapevine and, and give them to me. And they were so kind and generous. Um, I felt... I felt sad when I left. I felt that I had made some friends, despite the language barrier, especially the guy who ran this little, little tiny, would, would be like a quickie stop or, you know, one of those quick stop mm -hmm. grocery stores. Just a few things, but he always had fresh eggs. And I had a hot plate, so I cooked eggs in the morning for my breakfast. And he and I became, he spoke, he spoke some English, and he and I had a great time going back and forth. Uh, so I was sad. He he waved me away when I left. Uh, when I left on the bus, my last uh, morning in Ibrahim Pasha. So that was a great experience, and I I feel a lot of kinship with the people from that village. And I often wonder, gee, if I were to go back. Would they recognize me? Uh, it's been probably eight or nine years since I was there. I wouldn't. I don't think I would go to Turkey today. Uh, there's too much turmoil. Yeah, it would be. It would be a little scary. And while I was there, there was a, a bombing in the capital city, which is um, not Istanbul. It's um, well. I can't call up the name of that city, but there was a, a terrorist bombing in the city. So my husband was concerned about that and was um, texting me and writing me, you know, how far are you away from? And I said, oh, a mile, probably a thousand miles. I had to fly to Cappadocia from Istanbul. So, um, and I did my first balloon, hot air balloon ride there and uh, we went up I guess almost as far as you can go without oxygen because I could see the whole I could almost see a curve of the landscape and to see all those tufa stones uh, from a great distance was wonderful uh, in Tahiti the culture there 
is very relaxed. And I was so impressed by the tattoos that the Tahitian men wore. They were ornate and beautifully done. And of course, tattoos came from sailors who, who met the indigenous people and took up the art of tattooing or having themselves tattooed like because they thought it looked pretty cool too. And I almost had an ankle tattoo put on, but they told me if if we do that, you won't be able to go in the water for the rest of the time you're here. I thought, no, I, <laughs> I'm definitely going in the water. I had a little um, manta ray feeding experience where these giant manta rays would would come up close to shore and I held, held food in the flat of my palm and their mouths would come over it like a vacuum cleaner. Like they just hoovered up the food. That was very interesting. Um, and you could, you know, you could pick a meal off the trees around you. There are all these fruit trees, banana trees. Um, uh, it was a paradise. And I went to the main Island, um, but also to Raiatea and Huahini. And one of those islands uh, was in the film South Pacific. And I can't remember, I think it was Raiatea. So there was that connection because as a child, I just love South Pacific. I listened to the music constantly. And of course I'd seen the movie a couple of times and to be able to, to see the place where it was filmed was a lot of fun. So does that answer? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it definitely does. Uh, I loved hearing the different stories about just how you've experienced other cultures and where there is a language barrier and having it work out and still be being so friendly and having these great experiences. So obviously, you've talked a little bit about your creative side. Can you take us through the journey of your creativity to then you writing this book? Oh, well, I've always been a writer. Uh, I had, I had a lot of different jobs um, as an adult, but primarily for the, for the most years of my working career, I was a communications director and writer. And I wrote speeches. I, you know, anything to do with, Uh, the department I was in at the time I was at Duke and I would write and then the the law school um, I would write speeches for the dean and help plan reunion and I refurbished Duke magazine which had which was it looked like something out of the 18th century the cover had a bewigged person who could still be a barrister in England, but certainly not in the U.S. And I thought, man, we've got to have some interesting covers. And so I, I hired a designer and we just went to town. So I totally revamped the magazine and um, got a new logo. So some of my creativity was exercised then. Um, but that was also around the time well, maybe maybe another five years later when I got really interested in jewelry making because I've always loved jewelry. I got it from my mother who wore a lot of rhinestone pins. They were big in the 50s and early 60s. And so I thought, well, I'm not seeing what I would like to wear. So I think I'm going to start with making jewelry. And so I started out with just beading, which doesn't take a lot of expertise, but a good eye for what colors go together and how you make it interesting looking. But I thought this isn't enough. I mean, anybody can do this. So I started taking classes and learning how to metalsmith, which includes sawing metal, using a torch to solder pieces together. I sometimes melted the piece that I was working on in the beginning. It was a pretty steep learning curve. Um, So I just started designing and making my own jewelry. And that um, I had been in another art gallery in Hillsborough for four or five years. 
And um, I, I wanted to be affiliated with Frank because Frank had such a high standard. It's a very classy place with terrific artists who, who are collectible in my mind. And um, they juried me in on the basis of my jewelry designs. And in writing, I had, I've written outside the job um, for newspapers and a couple of magazines. I've written essays that eventually, some of which got incorporated into my book. But writing has always been like reading. Um, it's like my two hands, one's reading and one's writing. <laughs> And so uh, this book had been in my head for 20 years. Um, since 19, my mother died in 1990. And I didn't want to write it while my parents were alive. Well, my mother, because she was the one left. So, uh, and my sister, one of my sisters, saw an essay of mine that was published in a book and was very upset about it. It was ma mainly about my dad's suicide and my working through it. So that stopped me for a long, long time. But this, I had this voice inside that kept saying, you've got to write, you've got to write this. And I, it was to the point where I couldn't push it, shove it down anymore. And I've learned over the years that my gut usually tells me the truth, but to follow my gut, because the times I didn't was when I made my worst mistakes. So I thought, I, I better listen to this. I was, I was compelled to write because I'd been trying to figure out my whole adult life, why my father would choose to leave us. When, and, and why he, he allowed himself to go downhill. He suffered depression. Uh, but, but back to your main point about creativity, I guess I've always been an art lover. Always go to the museums in every large town I'm in that has an art museum. So that led me to wanting to tinker around with paint and collage. And I did that, and I, I sold a few pieces through the first gallery I was in because I showed my jewelry and my uh, two-dimensional mixed-media work. And for me, that's play. And, and for me, I would always get into a state of flow when I was working on something creative. And I, I haven't been able to achieve that in other aspects of my life. But... Uh, doing art and also writing. I can become very absorbed and I have to set the timer on my phone to remind me to get up from the computer and walk around a little bit because um, I could just sit glued for three or four hours if I'm really into it. And I know I'm on a roll and you don't want to stop that roll because gee, what if I sit down and, and it doesn't come back <laughs> the next time I want to capture it while the memory, the words are in me and have to get out. So that's sort of my creative journey. For, for a long time, I was a single parent and I really didn't have the time. I had a demanding full-time job and identical twin sons to raise. I didn't really have time for those creative pursuits then. It was all about surviving. Uh, <laughs> So it wasn't until my sons were out of college and on their own that I really started pursuing my passions, the things that I had to, had to set aside for so many years. So you've obviously been on a very interesting creative journey, and you've talked a little bit about the book. Can you tell us about your father's life and the topics you explore in your book? Yes, um, I would say the main themes are racism and anti-Semitism, depression and suicide. It's not a happy book, though I think there are some funny passages. And uh, people who've read it, who've gotten in touch with me, said they laughed out loud at a couple of places. 
so the book is about um, my father who was born into a Jewish family and they were more secular Jews. My, my, his father, my grandfather immigrated from Russia when he was just a boy. And when I knew him, Grandpa Herman, was his, was his, his name was Herman Kossoff, was a classical pianist and he sometimes did concerts, but he mainly taught students who adored him. And he taught some students who went on to some fame as pianists. So my father um, enlisted at 19 during World War II, and he was sent to the Overseas Repla Replacement Depot in Reesboro, North Carolina, where he met my mother, who was working at the, the USO. I almost said UFO. <laughs> it's USO. <laughs> and uh, I think a friend actually put them together. He started going to my maternal grandmother's home where my mother was living at the time. And she would roll out fried chicken, all this great old Southern food, the likes of which my father had never tasted. And he was immediately attached, you know, they, they fed him, they catered to him. This 19 year old boy who was going off to perhaps die. And he asked my mother to marry him before he shipped out. And she said, no, I don't want to be a war widow. So he didn't write her the whole two years, uh, the whole two years he was uh, stationed in England. He was a top turret gunner in a B-17 and also the flight engineer. And so instead of bedtime stories, when I was little, I heard stories about the war. And it was clear that my father must have lived his peak moments during the war, you know, the, the peak of terror and fear, camaraderie with the other. I could, st I still remember the, some of the names of his crewmates, at least three, three of them it was Augie, Bev, no, four, Augie, Bev, Fletcher, and Stoop. And the conversion story was one my father told me often, his conversion to Christianity. It's when they were coming back from Germany after a bombing mission. They were in a dogfight with Messerschmitts at the time, and their plane was riddled with bullets. And my dad didn't know whether they would get back alive, so he started praying. And he prayed that if God kept them safe and got them safely back to base, he would become a Christian. So that's what he did. And he had some experience of it by dating my mother, and I think he went to church with her a couple of times. So he gave up his heritage. He very much wanted to blend in as a good old Southern boy to the extent that, I guess I was about 12 at the time, he had a nose job. Now I thought my father was extremely handsome and his, he, was, he was quite the looker in his young days. And he had dark hair, hazel eyes, and his nose fit his face. I thought, I was so angry. We weren't told that was going to happen, we children. And so when he got off the plane, I it, it was I, I did a double take, and I couldn't even go up and hug him because this wasn't my father. Who is this man? But that was all part of him wanting so much to be considered a Southerner, and and be woven into the fabric of. Danville, Virginia. And we ended up in Danville accidentally. Here's a, a case of anti-Semitism. My father went to UNC and the University of Maryland for dental school on the GI Bill. And when he finished, um, he got his DDS. He wanted to practice in North Carolina because my mother wanted to be near her twin sister in Winston-Salem. So my father took the dental boards and flunked. And he had graduated 20th out of a class of 120 in dental school. And I was on the scene then, you know, he was trying to support me and my mother as well as be a student. So my mother did some inquiries with a, a doctor she worked for as a nurse in his office. 
And he went to the board of dental examiners and talked to a couple of the the dentists or whoever was on the board. And the story he came back with and told my mother was they didn't, they flunked you because they didn't want another Jew practicing in North Carolina. And my mother told me that was the only time she ever saw my father cry. So we ended up in Danville, Virginia, because it was just across the border from North Carolina and they were looking for a public health dentist. So he, he did one year of that and then started his own practice. So to sort of telescope this, all this information for you a bit, I'll just summarize that he was, his patients loved him. He had a great sense of humor. He was always telling jokes and joking around uh, with his patients. He also treated black people and no, no other dentist in town that we knew of but he would, he would treat them early in the morning before his white patients came or after the last white patient left because he said, I would lose my practice if the white people knew that I was treating blacks. And often he did it for free because a lot of them couldn't afford to pay. So my father, well, that's an aside, but it, it speaks to the whole ra racism, anti-Semitism issue in the book. My father was extremely successful, and he also was a good businessman. So he invested in property. He built his own office. He bought the lot, had the office built right across from Danville Memorial Hospital, which has a different name now. I'm not sure which. And he rented out the other side to another dentist. Then he bought four lots at Smith Mountain Lake when it, the dam had just been built, and there was nothing but a huge tub of mud and this little puddle in the middle. And, you know, we were laughing, saying, Dad, what were you thinking? But by the next summer, there was a gorgeous lake. And our, he had a cottage built, and we could look across the lake and see Smith Mountain, the green, the green mountain. And so financially, he did very well. He, he had good business sense, and he had a great sense of humor. And he got everything he wanted. He, he bought a plane. He renewed his pilot's license at age 50. He bought a little Cessna and uh, bought 125 acres in Pennsylvania County, populated them with Charlet cows. Those are uh, a brand. I was gonna <laughs> brand is the only word I can think of, but a brand of cattle that derived from French, French cows. They were white. And then eventually he wanted to build a house of, uh, of his own design out on the farm. And he did that. And he created a landing strip behind the house so he could take off from behind the house and fly to the Outer Banks for fishing weekends and come back. And he had a pool, uh, an outdoor pool, and had it enclosed because he had back problems. Um, being a dentist is not good for backs, you know bending over patients' mouths for eight, nine hours a day. And he had to have a couple of back surgeries. And then he became a chronic pain patient. And he made himself an invalid. Now, none of us can know another's pain, both emotionally and physically. But I can't imagine that the pain was so bad that he couldn't get out of bed and he bounced from hospital to hospital. He went to the VA, Duke, UNC Memorial, um, Baptist Hospital in Greensboro, I think. And I'm blocking on uh, a couple of other hospitals, but every time um, they would just kick him out and say, you know, he won't go to PT. Uh, and he was pre prescribing painkillers for himself because he could do that as a dentist until the pharmacist finally wised up and started refusing to fill his prescriptions. So I had married, was married by then, and toward the end of his life, I had my twins. They were about 18 months old when my father committed suicide. And he was on the psychiatric wing of UVA Hospital in Charlottesville on 24-hour suicide watch 
and yet he managed to do it. And that was my father. If he was determined to do something, he would find a way. And in this case, uh, it was taking himself out of our lives permanently. And we thought he was safe and protected there. Uh, I spoke later to his psychiatrist who told me that my father was the most difficult patient he ever had, that he could not begin to get through my father's pain. And a lot of it, I, I'm certain, was psychological pain and depression. It runs in families, and his mother, my grandmother Sadie, would have uh, catatonic depressions where she would just sit and stare out into space and not speak to anybody so she underwent electroconvulsive therapy, shock treatments, and that would usually bring her out of it. And so I'm pretty sure that at some point, my father got very depressed. And at that time, they didn't even have the SSRIs, um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are the arsenal of modern day pharmacological treatment of depression. Um, so those weren't available. Uh, and I can only guess at the psychological pain. I think some of it was being othered in the small town. And despite all his success, uh, never being able to win an election, he ran for city council and then he ran for county commissioner when he moved to the farm. And he lost both elections. And he told my mother... According to my mother, I guess I'm a born loser. And I'm thinking, you, you have your own airplane. You have a hangar. You have all this acreage. You, you made a lot of money. You did very well, and you're a loser. So I think that he just never felt accepted, and he, had, he was straddling two worlds. He didn't want to be Jewish. He, he still was respectful and kept up with my grandparents, thank goodness, because they were very influential in my life. Um, and I, when Dad was running for city council, I remember going to the Woolworths lunch counter with my mother, and a man sat down next to her on the other side, and he started talking about the upcoming city council election, and he said, well, I'm not sure who I'm going to vote for, but I'll tell you who I'm not going to vote for. I'm not going to vote for Hugh Kossoff. If that Yankee Jew thinks he knows how to run this town, he's got another thing coming. Another thing coming. And I was speechless. I was so hurt. And my mother, I could see her face turn red. And she said, I'm Mrs. Hugh Kossoff, and that's who I'm voting for. And then the man just mumbled something and got out of there quickly. But, you know, if he said it, others were saying it. And in terms of race, uh, as I may have mentioned, um, yeah, I think I did, that Danville was one of the foci of the civil rights movement in 1963. And people I knew in the white community were the oppressors. Um, my fifth grade teacher's husband was the chief of police who called in water cannon and deputized sanitation workers to trap peaceful demonstrators in the alley between the jail and the courthouse because they had come to pray for this teenager that had been thrown in jail for protesting peacefully. They had no weapons. All they had was their their bodies and their voices. And Danville just clamped down on that with an iron fist. And Chief McCain had the water hoses turned on these blacks in the alley, and it flushed them under cars, tore the clothes off the minister's wife. They had head injuries, and they couldn't go to Memorial Hospital. There was a black hospital called Winslow. And it was very understaffed, but that was the only hospital they could go to. And, you know, I learned all of that many, many years later. I was, I was incensed. But at the time I was in high school, uh, freshman, sophomore, 
was never talked about at school, never talked about in civics class, never talked about it in the church that I was attending with my parents. Um, it just, people wanted to sweep it under the rug, but it was way too big for that. And eventually Danville was on Walter Cronkite on the evening news. I don't remember seeing that because um, I tended to do my homework after dinner and not watch the news. So Danville was a terrible place if you were black or if you were Jewish or some other person of color or some other person who, who didn't have the prevailing Southern white pedigree. And I think a lot of that played into my father's depression and his thinking of himself as a loser. I don't know if I, if I can say any more about that. You, people are probably wondering how he did it. That may have crossed your mind. How did he do it if he was on 24 hours suicide watch? Well, he, he hanged himself with the tie to his bathrobe, just looped it around a hook on the bathroom door and sagged against it which means at any time he could have gotten up. It's not like you, like you see in the movies, somebody steps off a chair and once it's done, it's done. They can't, uh, if they change their mind, it's over. But my father willfully kept tightening the cinch and was sitting on the floor while he was asphyxiating himself. And that, again, placed my, my father's character and determination. And I find it so sad that he wasn't able to open up to anybody. And like many men of his generation, he wouldn't know a feeling if he stumbled across it. You know, we didn't talk about feelings in our family. And I don't think um, we ever talked about depression and I'm looking back now, I realized that I was depressed as a teenager and depression followed me through most of my adult life. And so, you know, I've taken those antidepressants and I've been to therapy um, with a psychologist. Um, I haven't been in the last 10 years, but most of my adult life, I was a poster child for therapy because I had a lot of things to learn about emotions and about my family and how living in that family um, made me who I am, both the good and the not so good. Depression, suicide, racism, and anti-Semitism. But I was very happy to find out. I went back to Danville to visit with a high school friend's 100-year-old mother. She has since passed away. But I was delighted to see that the public library was named the Ruby Archie Library. And Ruby Archie was one of the first black women on the city council, and she became the town's first black mayor. And I had had the privilege of interviewing her because I thought I was gonna do a book about Danville's role in civil rights. And I was naive um, because I realized uh, Ruby was willing to talk to me because she was one of those who was supporting the civil rights movement and working behind the scenes. But I realized it would take me many years to gain the trust of the black people in Danville. I mean, they, if I were they, I would think, well, who, who, who does she think she is? This white woman come waltzing in, asking me all these questions. I don't know you. And I, I realized that it wasn't anything that I could pursue at the time. And I wrote essays that got published about Danville. So I was making sure that the word about Danville in the 50s and 60s got out. But I, I never actually wrote a book about that. But I was able to incorporate some of what I learned in my book as the background for what was going on at the time I was growing up. So there were a lot of secrets, you know, there was, you know, like the Dan River, which um, Dan River Mills, 
used as a dump for, for its fabric dyes. And uh, it was also the world's best tobacco market. So there was always the smell of tobacco in the air. And they held giant tobacco auctions at the end of summer in Danville. And then Danville's other claim to Frank, claim to fame was that it was the last capital of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis fleeing Richmond ahead of uh, Ulysses S. Grant went to Danville and set up his headquarters in what is now the public library. And Danville was very proud of that fact. And I grew up thinking, well, this is really cool. Danville was a part of history. Well, now um, I think of it as, you know, Robert E. Lee was a traitor. He fought against his own United States. He was not a man, a man to be revered. And the South didn't have anything to be proud of by seceding from the Union. And it was only in order to preserve slavery. I've done enough reading that uh, no, there's no other explanation. They wanted their slaves and they wanted to keep black people enslaved. And I'm very passionate around that whole issue of um, the legacy of slavery and the fact that blacks still, you know, there's, there's still systemic racism in this country. Um, so those are things that propelled me in the book as well, to kind of look at what it does to people and, and, you know, look what anti-Semitism, I, I'm not saying that's alone caused my father's depression and suicide, but I saw what it did to me. And if my father had showed his emotions, I might've seen some of that in him. And I couldn't imagine being black then and being treated the way black people were treated then. I also talk in the book about uh, our black housekeeper who came to us as a teenager. And I, in the book, I call her Cora. She lived with us during the week and then went home to her family in Martinsville. And her family were sharecroppers, tobacco sharecroppers. But I loved her like the big sister I never had like the, my mother who was busy with the younger siblings and I didn't get much of her attention at that point. And I, I thought, you know, she's just like me, except her skin is darker. And what difference does that make? And I, I also saw that she couldn't go in to restaurants with us to eat. We would go to the Outer Banks um, for summer vacations and we'd always take Cora with us on vacations. And when I realized she wouldn't, she wouldn't get out of the car when we pulled up to a restaurant to eat. And when I realized that she wasn't coming in, I said, well, Cora, we have to go in and eat now. And she didn't budge. And then my father said, I'll order for you, Cora. And, and then I realized, oh, she can't, she can't sit down with us in this restaurant. So I stayed in the car and I had my lunch with Cora. And I think we all would have piled back in the car to eat, except at that point, there would have been seven of us, plus our cat, who we took to the beach. So too many to have any elbow room to eat, all eat in the car. But um, that really, that was an incident that really opened my eyes to racism. Um, I saw it up close and personal in, in my loving relationship with Cora. Yeah, I I hearing all of these stories and and knowing that there's so much more in the book, it sounds like your father was a great guy and very successful and it's unfortunate of the times with everything that happened and I'm grateful to hear that Danville is doing better. Um, you know, there's still a lot that could probably be done in the world. Uh, but to hear, you know, the extremes that it was in the 50s and the 60s and to know now even just something in theory as simple as naming the library after someone um, just shows how much progress has been made. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. And I, I try to look at um, the Chauvin trial, you know, his conviction of murder. Um, 
as a step in the right direction. I mean, that gives me some hope for the future, but we still have a long way to go. And I dedicated my book. Um, I'll just read the dedication because it goes to my motivation and my, my passion about writing this book. It's to all who suffer from the pain of being excluded and marginalized through intolerance in all its forms. Oh, can I tell you uh, one funny story? Go for it. <laughs> Since this is pretty heavy, um, a lot of my high school friends have read the book now, and they've, to a person, been complimentary. They said they loved it, couldn't put it down. And like me, they were totally unaware of what was going on in Danville in the 60s. And I got a message through Facebook uh, from a woman. Well, I have to back up and say I wrote about this in my book. When I was in first grade, I was sitting beside a boy who tried to kiss me. And I had a pencil in my hand, and I stabbed him in the knee with my pencil. And then I was terrified. Did I hurt him? Was I going to get into trouble? Um, I had no idea what was going to happen to me. And frankly, I don't remember if there were any repercussions, except that my family from there on called it the great pencil incident. So this woman uh, instant messages me and says she read the book, and she burst out laughing about the pencil incident. She said, I married that guy, and in his family, he also they also call it the pencil incident. So I just loved that. Oh, I definitely, I love that. That's a great story to end on. And I will also just generically note for the listeners that we are recording this the day after the verdict um, in the trial for George Floyd's murder. Now, with all of my guests, before I wrap things up, I like to ask a random question. Your question is going to be kind of simple and a little different, and it is simply, what is your least favorite chore? Whoa, just one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dusting. <laughs> You could probably write your name on many of the surfaces in my house because, because I, I hate the dust. We have a lot of bookshelves, and I've collected art over the years, fine blown glass pieces and other things, and I just don't want to take the time and trouble to, to do that. So it may get done every quarter, maybe. All right, that brings this episode to a close. I will be leaving Miranda's website in the description, so feel free to check that out. And of course, if you would like to read her book, The Rope of Life, it is available in audio format on e-readers, in book, at stores, and on Amazon. But of course, we always encourage supporting local bookstores. They are the ones who deserve our patronage. So, and of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, we are on social media on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So feel free to go give those pages a follow. Everything can be found on our website. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, the Patreon is in the website as well. Thank you so much, Marinda, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next week. Bye. Thank you. And bye-bye. Thank you.